Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream. Welcome to the Origin Science Scholars Program, a series of talks on current research topics in origin sciences. Hello, my name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I am pleased to serve as your host for this series. The talk you're about to watch is entitled Introduction to DNA, What Makes DNA Tick? presented by Dr. Mark Adams of the Department of Genetics at Case Western Reserve University and an ISO Fellow. Dr. Adams was a co-founder of Celera Corporation, where he invented the first practical method for rapid gene sequencing, a crucial technology for the Human Genome Project. And from my perspective, uh, when I think of origins, I think of, of how DNA has shaped the evolution of organisms over time. And finally, it's now been 10 years since the human genome was first sequenced a 10-year period that went very quickly for me, and I imagine many of you will remember the time when that was announced. And so I have a, a few uh, nuggets of uh, information that have come out in that 10 years about how our interpretation and understanding of the human genome has changed and evolved and built on that knowledge. So beginning, what does DNA look like? Well, you've perhaps all seen the double helix. Um, this is two chemical strands of sequence uh, comprised of the alphabet A, C, G, and T, which are four different chemical entities. They pair so that two, the two strands of the double helix are held together by base pairs, or an A and a T that belong together, and a G and a C that are always adjacent to one another. And this double helix is the iconic image of DNA. Of course, the images of DNA are everywhere. Uh, you can find plenty of them on Google Images, which is what I did. Uh, and sometimes they're very, abs they're very chemically precise. Sometimes they're microscopic views of the real chromosomes that you would see in a, hum in a single human cell at metaphase, such as this. Sometimes they're kind of fanciful or creative, if you will. Uh, and sometimes you can really see physical DNA itself. This is the DNA that would come from about a teaspoon of bacterial cells cells. Uh, if you isolate the DNA from those cells in ethanol, uh, you can actually see the DNA. Um, of course, you can't read its sequence, but you can tell that it's actually there. Um, the DNA, of course, is packaged in the cell. Each of us has 23 pairs of chromosomes, one of each pair inherited from mom and one of each pair inherited from dad. And those comprise a total of about six billion base pairs of DNA. Okay, that's three billion on each, each of the chromosome pairs. Now, if you want to see, uh, each, each of those base pairs is, is not very long to begin with, but all the DNA in a single cell is about two meters long. Okay, that's quite a bit, that's about as tall as I am. And if you stacked all the DNA in all of your cells end to end, it would reach all the way to the sun and halfway back. So there's a tremendous amount of DNA in all of these cells that are present in our human body. And so one of the terrifically complicated things that uh, all eukaryotic cells have figured out how to do is package up that DNA and shrink it so that it fits in the nucleus of the cell. And that packaging is called chromatin. And you can kind of see an idea of it here. Here's the double helix and the base pairs that we talked about. That's all wound up uh, into nucleosomes, which are about 150 bases long. And then those are packed in turn into increasingly complicated structures that compress the chromosome such that it can fit inside the cell. Now that chromatin is not just packaging material. Uh, and as you'll see when we get uh, a little bit further along, it's critically important to, for the DNA to be able to open up for genes to be expressed and do their thing. Okay. So the central dogma of molecular biology is that the DNA, of course, doesn't do everything on its own. It has to be expressed. It has to be translated into information that the cell can use. And that happens in two steps. So the DNA sequence, these A, C's, G's, and T's that I described, are first transcribed into RNA. And in this process, T becomes U, and we have an RNA sequence here. That in turn is translated into protein, and these are three-letter codes for amino acids, 
methionine, serine, and arginine. So that the information that's encoded in DNA can be directly by a two-step process, converted into the information in proteins, which are, of course, the things that do the work of the cell. They are the enzymes that metabolize food, they're the keratin that forms hair, um, and all the things that make our cells do what they do, and in fact, the machinery that transcribes and translates is, of course, also made out of proteins. And one of the things that we've learned um, as uh, more recently in the history of molecular biology is that there are many genes that also code for RNAs that are functional on their own without being translated into proteins, and that's one of the evolving areas that I'll talk about more at the end. But this central dogma has held up well, despite the fact that there are, as in all things biology, there are exceptions to the rule. Okay. So these transcription and translation processes I'll just briefly describe. We have a, a, dub, a double helix of DNA and a very complex system of proteins that work together called RNA polymerase. And when all of the correct features of the DNA are present, a, a particular region of the genome can be transcribed and translated into protein, and that protein can be made. And so the RNA polymerase does the making of the RNA, and the ribosome, which is even more fantastically complex assembly of proteins, <coughs> takes that RNA sequence and uh, using tRNAs converts it into a protein sequence, which will then go in turn and do the work of the cell. So once again, uh, in, a cell, in, in each of the eukaryotic cells, in bacteria there's no nucleus, but the DNA is in there anyway, uh, there's a series of chromosomes, and the genes are laid out along those chromosomes. So a gene is just a region of the chromosome that encodes the information to do something. It's usually a protein coding sequence. Um, one of the complications of eukaryotic cells, and human cells in particular, is that the genes are really kind of hard to find because the parts that code for protein only add up to about 1% of the DNA, with the other 99% doing other things, some of which I'll allude to. But, uh, and those, that 1% for a given gene isn't just right next to each other, it's split up into exons and introns, with the exons being the interesting bits, those are the boxes here, that get collected together into an RNA sequence. So there, the information is very widely distributed in little tiny pieces across the genome. Our cells amazingly know how to pull all, the, all of this information together. The best computer programs cannot begin to do a good job of this yet, even though the genome has been decoded there's still lots of interpretation left to do to figure out what all of the information content is and how our cells read that out to make individual cells, tissues, and then the whole, the whole um, of the human body. Okay, then those RNAs are in turn, many of them, most of them turned into protein. Okay, so we have the same genome in every cell. But, of course, not every cell is identical. Lung cells aren't skin cells, aren't eye cells. And so, even though they have all the same genome, uh, each cell is different because they express or turn on different genes, different regions of the chromosome that uh, specify the functions that make an eye cell different from a, a skin cell or a lung cell. Some things they have in common, like the need to transcribe and translate uh, proteins, uh, and some things are different, like the need to, uh, um, for photoreceptors to detect light, for example. Um, and so that process is driven by gene expression. And that's, uh, the differences in cell types are drawn by differences in gene expression. Now again, I'll come back, because we've learned a lot about how this works in the last 10 years as well. So we'll take a little break now and ask if you have questions for a few minutes. Before I get too far ahead into advanced DNA, uh, let's stick with the basics and see if we have some clarification. How does the cell deal with the DNA getting tangled? I mean, two meters of stuff in a tiny little... Yes. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So there are specific enzymes called DNA helicases that wind and unwind the DNA. And that's sort of at a very local level um, to make sure that the, the double helix can wind and unwind as necessary. But then there are additional proteins that assist in the assembly of chromatin and the higher order structure. And of course, every time the cell divides, that, has, that packaging has to be completely undone so that the DNA can replicate and then completely done up again. Okay? And human cells can divide about once every 24 hours, sometimes a little faster under certain circumstances. So it has to be a very, a very fast and efficient process. You mentioned that the genes are packaged in chromatin. 
I'm not exactly familiar with what protein is, what's protein in it, and what, what's, what's its function. Right, um, so chromatin is, um, so the basic unit of chromatin is the histone. And a histone is a complex of uh, five proteins that uh, ha with the DNA wrapped around it in about a unit of about 150 nucleotides. That's sort of the, the fundamental unit of chromatin. And then those histones, or um, uh, sorry, those nucleosomes, that's a nucleosome unit, are, are bundled up into higher order structures. And all together that's called chromatin. So it's, it's the, the, the DNA with the proteins that help package it and hold it up together in a nicely packaged unit. How do you know all this? Do you, have you actually, I mean, you've seen this actually happen, but with what kind of machinery or spectra, whatever? Yeah, so the, one of the wonderful things about DNA is that, of course, it is very small, right? Um, and so much of what's learned has been inferred by very clever classical experiments in genetics using viruses or phage, um, and so that the, many of these things can just be in, in, inferred, and I, without, I can't, without, a, a perfect example isn't coming to mind right off the top of my head. But there are also, there are imaging techniques that you can use for looking at the structures of chromatin at, and at DNA itself, scanning transmission electron microscopy and, and a variety of other things like that. Do you need the structure to understand the DNA? I believe you do need the structure of the double helix. The, the double helix provides one of the most, per, perhaps the most, well the DNA has to do two things. It has to encode information. And you don't need two strands or you don't need a double helix for that. But it also needs to be copied. And, a, and the double helix provides a copying mechanism. So there's, um, obviously the two strands are redundant to one another. And so if each is copied, you have two identical copies of what you started with which is what you need when the cell divides. So the double helix, um, besides being a very stable and redundant structure, provides the basis for cell division and for rep faithful replication of the information that's encoded in it. They are linear, and so they're, the chromosomes are linear, and each strand of the double helix is linear in eukaryotes. In many prokaryotes, there are circular chromosomes in which it, the, the end ties around and is I'll get it back to the beginning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Glenn Starkman, Professor of Physics at Case Western Reserve University and Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I'm pleased to serve as your host for this lecture, Introduction to DNA, What Makes DNA Tick by Dr. Mark Adams. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the first part of Dr. Adams's lecture, he reviewed the basic properties of DNA and genomes. In the second part, he will describe the role that DNA plays in evolution. Now we return to the lecture. So we should move on at this point, and uh, obviously lots of questions, and there'll be time for more questions as we go along. So I wanted to talk a little bit about DNA and evolution, and of course, we have known for a long time that, many, that organisms share many features in common. And in fact, many proteins have very similar functions in different organisms. And one of the classic examples of that is a gene called PAX6. It's a master regulator of eye development. This is a cartoon of the PAX6 protein attached to DNA. It's a transcription factor. It tells certain genes to be turned on wherever PAX6 is expressed. This is the protein sequence of the gene from human and from Drosophila, the fruit fly. And you can recognize, based on these letters that are in the middle, that there's a lot of similarity between these two proteins. And in fact, uh, the loss of this gene in human or mouse or fly results in blindness or aniridia. And so you can see that in human, in a developing mouse embryo that has no eyes, and in a fly that has no eyes. And remarkably, this gene from the fly can restore eyes to a mouse that has missing its own copy. Okay? So this gene doesn't specify everything that has to do with making an eye, it's just the switch. And when you turn on the genes, uh, when you turn on the genes in the mouse to specify an eye, it works. And likewise, you can grow an eye on the wing of a fly if you express it in the wrong place. A really wonderful story about the shared function of proteins across evolution. One of the byproducts of the Human Genome Project is the genome projects of many things that you wouldn't perhaps would thought, have thought, would have their own genome projects, like the alpaca. 
How many of you have heard of the alpaca genome project? <laughs> Cynthia Bell has heard of the alpaca genome project. <laughs> what else do we have here? How about the megabat and the microbat? Okay. Now you might, as taxpayers, not have thought that a megabat and a microbat, microbat deserve their own genome project, but in fact these have been incredibly valuable at helping us interpret the evolutionary history of mammals and to infer function in the human genome. And the reason is that this is an, a, a cartoon of an alignment of the human chromosome 16 with the mouse. And what you see is that there are matches across the entire sequence. Not, and I, you can't tell it from here, but I can assure you that it's not just the proteins that align across the genome. I said only about 1% of the genome codes for protein, but in fact, close to 5% of the mammalian genome is conserved through evolution. That means sequences are shared in mouse and human and dog and rat and alpaca that are more than you would expect by chance. And most of that sequence that's conserved is presumed to serve some regulatory function. So there are conserved protein coding sequences, but there's three or four times as much conserved sequence that does not code for protein. It's presumed to be regulatory, to regulate when genes are turned on and turned off, where they are expressed, at what time in development, and in what cell types. And so that that regulatory program is also conserved across the mammals. An example of how, what that looks like here is in the promoter of a gene that it promotes blood cell development, these black boxes all are identical sequences in human, mouse, chicken, pufferfish, and zebrafish. So across these widely different vertebrates, there are perfectly conserved sequences. And the reason they're perfectly conserved is that there are transcription factors that are also very similar in these organisms that bind to these sequences and specify expression of the Tal1 gene and the promotion of blood cell development. Okay. And uh, Greg Elgar's group has done a very comprehensive study looking at regions that are very similar in fugu, which is the puffer fish, and human. And he's taken about He's identified about 1,400 of these extraordinarily conserved regions and tested what their function might be in the fish, uh, in zebrafish, by looking at 25 of these sequences and whether they can drive expression, just take that sequence out, put it next to green fluorescent protein, which is green and fluoresces, okay, it's a good name for that protein. Um, and what, they, what he found was that most of these sequences drive exquisitely specific gene expression. So you just take out a small conserved sequence that's present in both fugu and, and mouse or human or rat and express it in a fish and it turns just a single cell green because just that little piece of DNA alone is enough to specify where that gene is expressed. So there is a lot of conserved regulatory sequence in the genome, and this genome comparison is what's able to help us understand and look for that, something that we really hadn't appreciated uh, before. Okay, we have another time, time for a little bit more questions, either about DNA or about evolution. Has any genome, co jo <laughs> genome comparisons been done with dinosaurs, uh, prehistoric animals versus current? Um, the, the, the closest we've gotten to prehistoric animals that have been analyzed are Neanderthals. Uh, and because DNA that is too old or that's fossilized, we can't get DNA out of fossils for the, to the, to the uh, first approximation. And so there's no DNA left to analyze from dinosaurs. Um, but the Neanderthal sequence is starting to come out. It's a little difficult to interpret still, um, but there's, I think that that's gonna be very interesting when it does. Yeah, how much of the DNA is actually junk DNA that we don't need versus the total package? That's an excellent question. And so I haven't met anyone who's willing to get rid of their junk DNA yet. <laughs> um, so just because we don't know what it, what it does uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's junk. So there are uh, repetitive sequences in the human genome, alu elements and line elements that are present 300 bases long, a million copies. Gee, you'd think you could get rid of a few hundred thousand of those and it wouldn't really cause any problem. And perhaps that's true. Um, what I can say is that it's very expensive from the cell standpoint to replicate all those six billion base pairs of DNA. And you, you'd think that if some of it were dispensable, it would have been gotten rid of, expensive in an energy standpoint, um, in terms of the cost of dividing, uh, uh, the, the energy cost of dividing the genome. 
So I think just because we can't explain what it all does doesn't necessarily mean that some of it's junk. So can you synthesize the PAX-6? Uh, can you, you can move it from the mouse to whatever? You can. And if you, you do, do you have to have the timing specific to make the eyesight come back? Yes, you, you can. Um, w the mouse has great tools for genetic manipulation, as does the fruit fly. Not all, not all organisms do, but you can, in fact, move a fruit fly PAX6 gene into the mouse genome and have it expressed at the particular time and place that you want it to be expressed. Yep. And now you'd like to think, well, we could do this with humans, too, if we can do it with mice. Um, and if, that's, a whole, that's a topic for another discussion uh, about genetic engineering of the human genome. Um, I guess I was wondering, when you say you've mapped the human genome, what does that exactly mean? And is it the same for every single human, or is it a specific human that you've mapped? Um, how does that work? Right. Like, uh, what's the difference? Is my genome different than, than hers or than yours? How does, what's, what is the genome? Good. So the answer to the first question, map, has changed. The meaning of that has changed over time. Now I would say to map a genome means to sequence the complete genome. Um, in the past, it had other meanings that had to do with things that were unacceptable substitutes for sequencing the whole genome. As far as the differences among people, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next section, and then we can talk more about that in the question and answer period after dinner. We hope you've been enjoying the Origins Science Scholars Program Lecture on DNA, What Makes DNA Tick? In our first two segments, Dr. Adams described the properties of DNA and how it encodes our genome and that of all other living organisms. In our final segment, Dr. Adams will tell us about the new discoveries in genomics in the near decades since the completion of the Human Genome Project. Now back to the talk. So what's new in the 10 years since the, since the genome sequence was published? And I say the first genome sequence that was published because in the interim, several more have been sequenced and we have started to get a little bit of visibility in, or quite a bit of visibility into how people are different and how the genome varies across individuals. Okay. So, uh, February 2001, two publications, one from Solera Genomics, which is the company that I was involved in, was the private effort to sequence the genome, and the other from a consortium of labs funded by the Sanger Institute and a variety of governments around the world, and fortunately came to largely the same conclusion about what the chief features of the genome were, one of which was that there were many fewer genes than many people had expected, only about 30,000 in the human genome, whereas estimates had ranged up to 100,000 before that. Uh, interest, and lots of people were surprised, oh, only 30,000 genes. Well, as the dust has settled now, that number has gone down significantly, and it seems that there are only about 21,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. And everything that we do, everything that you see, everything that makes us human is encoded in those 20,000 genes plus three, three or 4,000 non-coding, non-protein coding RNAs that are expressed and that are functional as RNA sequence, and the careful timing and cell type specificity of those. And one of the things that, um, so, okay, so um, this made a big splash, and of course, the big challenge was that we still didn't know how to interpret most of those three billion base pairs. And much progress has been made in that area since then, in these areas since then. And so the three little vignettes that I'm gonna to talk to you about are alternative splicing, which makes those 21,000 genes potentially have many more functions about regulation, 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 all of the myriad ways in which our cells have evolved to specify how genes are turned on and, and, and where and when. And then a little bit about human genetic variation. So alternative splicing, Recall that I mentioned that there are exons and introns that make up a gene. So the exons have the protein coding information, but they're not all right next to each other along the chromosome. They're spread out with intervening sequences in between called introns, which are the thin bars here, the exons, the tall bars. Okay. So this is a particularly uh, significant or particularly strong example, not everyone is this dramatic, uh, but the principle is the same, which is that in one mRNA transcript, there are two completely different proteins encoded. One is calcitonin, which is involved in regulation of calcium levels throughout the body, and the other is CGRP, which is involved in vasodilation, the opening and closing of the, um, of the vessels, blood vessels. 
encoded by the same gene. And you might think, well, okay, there's two different proteins depending on how they're spliced. But of course, this splicing pattern isn't random. It's carefully controlled by another set of proteins, which are RNA binding proteins. And when a certain protein, which is who, is present, then calcitonin is made. And when a different protein is present in the cell, TIA, the other protein is made. And this is true, there are hundreds of RNA binding proteins encoded in the genome, and this process of alternative splicing is really quite pervasive. It's now estimated that um, the vast majority, 75 plus percent of multi-exon human genes are subject to alternative splicing. And that alternative splicing can result in a different protein being made. It may be subtly different, or it might be quite different in terms of both its structure and its function. And so some diversity of information, of functional information, can be expanded from the set of 21,000 human genes based on this pattern of alternative splicing. And this was work that was done by Wallow's lab in the Department of Genetics. Okay. I mentioned that gene regulation is important, what genes are turned on and turned off in different cells and developmental stages. And there are really three broad categories of strategies that the cell uses to turn on and turn off genes. Okay, the first um, is, uh, so first of all, this little um, arrow represents a gene. Genes, uh, virtually, uh, genes always have a promoter, which is a sequence right next to it that encodes information for getting it started, for expressing it and attracting that RNA polymerase to transcribe it. They often have an enhancer, which might be some distance away, and as its name suggests, will enhance expression of the gene under certain circumstances. So when the right set of proteins binds, some at the promoter, some at the enhancer, these might interact with each other, the gene is turned on, the RNA is made, the protein is made, and we think of that gene as being expressed. So these proteins and transcription factors are one method of regulation. Another method of reg regulation that has become much more uh, widely accepted in the last 10 years is that of epigenetic regulation. You've perhaps heard this term epigenetics or the epigenome, and what that means is information that's genetic because it has to do with DNA, but it's not encoded in the ACGT base pairs. There are other chemical modifications that you can make to DNA, in this case with a methyl group, um, on C, the C nucleotide becomes methyl C, and that the presence of that methyl group causes the gene to be turned off. If you sprinkle methyl groups across the promoter, that inhibits RNA polymerase activity and the gene is not expressed. The removal of those marks can turn on gene expression. And this DNA methylation, because it's covalent, it's a permanent mark on the DNA, it's reversible, but it's, it's, a, it's a physical modification of the DNA sequence, is stable. And in fact, during replication, that methylation mark is replaced in the newly synthesized DNA, and so this is a stable pattern of, of retaining genes to be on or off in a cell. Another epigenetic regulation uh, is, has to do with how the DNA is packaged in histones. So recall that um, we talked about how DNA is all packaged up in chromatin. Well, it turns out this chromatin is highly dynamic. And again, covalent modifications or physical attachments of chemicals to the histone proteins, in fact, can specify whether or not that DNA is tightly compacted and therefore can't be transcribed and expressed, or whether it's a more open conformation and all the proteins that need to can get in there and do their work to do transcription and translation. There are now more than 20 different modifications to the histone proteins that are known, and in fact there's an evolving histone code, like the genetic code, that if you know the pattern of modifications that are present at a given promoter, you can predict whether or not that gene is going to be expressed. This is more a little more complicated because there are so many different modifications to consider, um, but the structure of the, uh, of the chromatin and of the histones around the gene um, can be modified, again, in a highly regulated way by specific enzymes that attach or remove these modifications that promote or inhibit gene expression. 
company. And finally, as I alluded to earlier, we've learned a lot more about uh, these non-coding RNAs, as they're called. So these RNAs are transcribed, but they're not translated into protein. We're so used to thinking about proteins doing all the work of the cell that these were kind of ignored for a long period of time. A lot of people knew that they were there, but said, oh, they must be artifacts, or they're just intermediates on their way somewhere else, or they're just an accident that the cell made this transcript because it didn't know any better, or something like that. But now we're appreciating that these have very important regulatory roles. One particular class is in microRNAs. So you may have heard of oncogenes and tumor suppressors, which are of course important in cancer. Oncogenes turn on uncontrolled cell growth and promote uh, a tumor, tumor suppressors, as you might have guessed turn off the genes, uh, are, are, are the opposite of oncogenes. They control cell proliferation. They prevent the cell from um, uh, just wildly going along and dividing um, or leaving its, um, the place where it belongs. And these two types of genes coordinately regulate a set of target genes that are involved in cell proliferation, division, invasion, and so on. And what we've learned recently is that particularly in cancer, microRNA genes, which are only about 20 nucleotides of RNA, are vitally important in maintaining the program of gene expression that a cell sets up. So transcription factors might define the overall program like PAC6, the switch that turns on the development of the eye. But it's microRNAs that keep an eye cell an eye cell, that keep uh, a cell in the lining of the colon from becoming a colon tumor for example. And when these microRNAs become dysregulated, then that's, uh, that, that helps promote the process of, of tumorigenesis. Okay. And there are other classes of non-coding RNAs that probably also participate in this process in ways that we're still trying to figure out. So, switching to human genetic variation. Um, so we've got alternative splicing, which gives us complexity of expression from the proteins. We've got several different ways in which genes are regulated, turned on and turned off. And then layer on top of that the differences that we see around just looking around in the room. We are all in fact different from one another. And one of the, the basis for that difference is in single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. These are places where at one particular place on the chromosome, there's a, for example, a C uh, or a CG base pair uh, in one chromosome and a TA base pair in the other. And these occur about one in every thousand base pairs in the human genome, or many millions uh, in an individual and across the population. And of course, many of these are shared, that uh, half of us in the room might have a C and the other half might have an A at a given position. And some are private or some are more rare, so that there are places in the genome where we each differ from, from, from the other. Or there's a, there is a potential in the genome where only one of us might have that particular sequence. Single nucleotide polymorphisms are only one class of variation. There are inversions. There's a, a, a huge inversion uh, that uh, is present in quite a few people of European ancestry. There are deletions, copy number differences, segmental duplications. Some people have four copies of this gene. Some people have five. It's quite dynamic, in fact, and there are many, uh, many variations around this. In fact, probably much more of this structural variation than had been anticipated uh, in the human genome. And so it's not just enough uh, to, to, to sequence the SNPs to find out what the variation is among people. A large project funded by NIH called the Thousand Genomes Project is underway now to sequence the genomes of a thousand people and really explore what the extent of all of that variation is. Um, so far, the most common variants, those that are present in at least 5% of the population, um, or at least a couple people in this room would be a good way of putting that, um, have been described. So we have a pretty good catalog of the common variation in the genome, but not so much the rare variation. And a catalog exists now of over 30 million SNPs, or places in the genome where people differ from one another. And these can be used to try to find links between specific genes, specific disease variants, uh, specific gene variants and disease. 
Another application is in uh, tracing the ancestry of different groups of people. Uh, and this is a study that was done looking particularly at uh, people of Indian descent or so, um, um, Southern Asian descent, which are in red. Uh, Europeans are in blue, Asians are in this light purple color, and Africans are in orange here. And this, this study, which looked at um, about a million SNPs, found that despite the really incredible ethnic and linguistic diversity in India, the genetic uh, pattern, there's quite a bit more shared genetic history than was anticipated in this study. And you can use the same kind of uh, analysis of human genetic variation to track uh, the migration of modern human populations out of Africa. There is more genetic variation in Africa than in the rest of the world combined. Okay? So uh, that means that all of the, the people in the world from Asia and Europe and North America, um, Indonesia and so on, are, represent a subset of the diversity of modern humans that was present in Africa at the time that modern humans evolved. Okay. So all of this genome sequencing technology, of course, has, if you can sequence the alpaca genome and the microbat genome, then cer certainly somebody's gonna come along and say, well, what about sequencing my genome? And Craig Venter, um, you know he's not humble if he named his research institute the J. Craig Venter Institute, okay? <laughs> um, has had his genome sequenced several times now. As each generation of technology comes along, uh, he sequences his genome again and interestingly continues to find new things, which is to say that even though, that even the genomes that we have now are not complete, and there is still more to learn. Um, but it is possible, if, if any one of you wanted to have your genome sequenced today, you could do it. And there are a variety of companies that offer this service to you. Now then, you what you have to think about is, of course, how much it would cost, and the cost is coming down. It's on the order of $20,000 or so now. It'll probably be five to 10,000 by the end of the year. Year. The technology does keep increasing uh, in terms of the throughput and goes down in the cost. But you'll have to interpret it. And uh, you know the, the entire scientific establishment, uh, and I'm not really glossing over a lot of things, there's still a lot left to learn about the human genome. Um, but if you know what you're looking for, and there are a handful, or more than a handful, there are hundreds of specific variants that are present in the genome that for which we do know what their function is, and that might give you some clue about how you, uh, about diseases that you might be particularly at risk for. Um, I can give you pretty much the take home messages, which is watch your diet and exercise more. Uh, <laughs> save you the $10,000, but, um, but this raises a number of questions uh, about privacy and other things that we can talk about after dinner and what the value of that information is. And although I recognize that what I will close with is perhaps not the best thing to close with right before dinner, um, <laughs> There is another genome project that's going on in parallel with the Human Genome Project, and it's called the Human Microbiome. Now, the human body contains about 10 to the 12th cells, human cells, that is, and about 10 to the 13th bacterial cells, okay? That means that we have 10 times more bacterial cells in our body than human cells, okay? Think about that. Just in the mouth, there are over 600 species of bacteria. Okay? Most of these are, you know, this, is no, this is normal. Okay? This is not something that you need to go out and get an antibiotic for. Okay? <laughs> They're commensal. They live with us very happily. They uh, certainly do good things for us. When that balance gets off, they can do bad things for us too, or to us. But we have very little visibility until a few years ago of what the scope of the microbial diversity was in the human body, let alone in other environments around the world. And the Human Microbiome Project is now really in full force and scaling up to really characterize all of these organisms. Most of them can't be grown in the lab, so they can't be studied individually. Many of them only work together as consortia. And uh, suffice it to say, there's a lot to learn here, both about the, just from a basic science standpoint of how all these organisms um, uh, coexist with one another and with us, but also what, what roles they fill in basic human biology, uh, because they are in fact everywhere. So with that, I will thank you for your 
your attention. Uh, we will go for dinner and we'll have time for more questions uh, during that time and afterwards. So thank you very much. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It has been brought to you with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins.